So welcome, my name is uh, Lele Yumagulova, I'm a Bashkir woman, and I'm joining you today from the traditional and ceded territories of the Sinex people. Um, today we will be uh, uh, traveling to the beautiful Mi'kma'ki lands, but to begin with, I thought I would just introduce a little and talk briefly about the program that we have. Um, all right, so Preparing Our Home is an indigenous youth-led program. And it's, it's a program that really focuses on building resilience in indigenous communities through nation to nation learning. So really looking at the strengths and the power that the nations, uh, that nations bring. And I'll just keep admitting people as I talk as well here. So it's based on indigenous science, land-based learning, uh, youth leadership. Uh, it's really at the, at the core of it is intergenerational planning. So youth and elders working together. It focuses on capacity building as well as technical training in emergency management. Um, and at the core of it is really peer mentoring. So youth uh, leading together. So this, this sharing circles came about as we pivoted into pandemic space to continue the learning. Normally we gather together and there are community workshops that the youth lead. And we've hosted over 700 people over the last little while. So really grateful that you are able to join us today. Who is in the room today? So these are some of the organizations that registered. Really grateful to have a broad scope. So indigenous-led organizations, academic partners, government, uh, NGOs. And that is the space that is the creative space in which uh, kind of emergency management community safety operates. I just wanted to take a minute here and to celebrate the incredible person Amber, that is uh, really at the core, uh, was at the core of this program of emergency preparedness program in the Mi'kmaq lands. Amber has done exceptional work in the communities within the organization and nationally. So here is our presentation at Adaptation Canada 2020. Amber is moving on from her position into a new role um, in public safety. And I just want to wish all the best and huge thank you for the leadership and the incredible work that you've brought, Amber. So today we sit in a circle and just a couple of sharing circle fundamentals. The circle symbolizes complete, completeness. So everybody who made it today are the people who were meant to be here today. Each one of us is equal and each one of us belongs. Our primary responsibility today is to listen. So silence is entirely acceptable response. If you're the kind of person that talks a lot, maybe today you step back a bit. If you're the person who really kind of since back a bit, maybe you lean forward a bit. And with that, I will stop my screen sharing and pass it on to Elena Silivoy, who will welcome us uh, to this circle. Thank you, Elena. <clears throat> uh, thank you, Lily. And again, um, thank you to Amber, because uh, if it wasn't for Amber and her hard work, um, you know, I wouldn't be fortunate enough to be here or to have met you, Lily, and your family. Um, so yeah, huge thank you to Amber for getting this program up and running and, you know, all of the, the guidance and, and working together. Uh, it was, a, it was an amazing journey. Uh, when I first met Amber, she was uh, a summer student and became a really close friend of mine and, and a, a, a colleague. Um, so it, um, good luck on your new journey, Amber, and thank you for being here with us today. Um, so with that being said, um, Gwe. Uh, Ninda Luis and Alana Silaboy. Um, so hello, my name is Alana Silaboy. I am from Sebega Negadi First Nation in the district of Sebega Negadi uh, here in the mainland of Nova Scotia. I am the culture, education, and engagement manager within the aquatics department um, at CMM. So um, before our departments got really big, um, I worked for um, for all of the departments and not just aquatics. So um, unfortunately, we've gotten really, really big. So um, I had to choose where I want it to go. And um, water is my heart, water is my life. So, um, you know, I continue my path um, with water, uh, with the protection and of the water and its species and its habitat. Um, so today I want to talk about, or I want to welcome you all into this circle. Um, I lit a smudge. Um, so that we can start off this meeting or the circle with good intentions. Um, I want to um, kind of echo what Lily said with, you know, this being a circle and we're all equal. And that's why we believe in sitting in circles, um, you know, because there's, it, 
the knowledge is being shared and passed around and we're, we're moving forward and we're all equal. Um, even if you go into some, some council chambers, our tables are circles because there's no, you know, there's no leadership. It's, we're all equal. So I want to welcome you to taking a dive into um, the work that we're doing here in Mi'kmaq um, on the East Coast. Um, I want to, you know, ask the creator to watch over all of us um, and continuing to help us with our journey um, and, you know, give us the tools that we need mentally, physically, culturally, spiritually, um, that we need to continue to do for our jobs and our roles for our communities, no matter what community you're from or, or where you work and where you live. Um, I ask the curator to protect you and to guide your hands with good intentions and your mind and your heart and your eyes. Um, and usually we get an elder to do this, but unfortunately we're all working from home and it's hard to get elders in on these kind of platforms. So I do apologize for that, but um, I feel very honored to open this, this circle. And I hope that, you know, what we learn and share here today um, is well received. And I hope that, you know, we're able to help each other and move forward for our communities and for our future. So, uh, Wulalio. And I think Scott is going to start the presentation. Thank you yep. so much for that beautiful welcome to Magiella. Yeah, thanks, Alana. And I think before we jump into it, we'll uh, we'll introduce ourselves. So I'll I'll go ahead. Uh, I'm Scott Mackinell. I'm calling today from the traditional unceded ter territory of the Mi'kmaq. Um, I'm located in Shubenacadie, Nova Scotia. Um, a lot of the my work that I'm going to talk about today was done um, under the title of Emergency Mitigation Officer. I am currently um, transitioning into Amber's former role as the the uh, project manager. So as I'm sure you can tell by Lily and Alana's introductions um, of Amber, uh, big shoes to fill, but uh, trying, trying my best. Thanks. I'll introduce myself next. So my name is Kate McDermott. I'm also calling in from the traditional and suited territory of the Mi'kmaq people here in Mi'kmaq. Uh, I am the emergency management planning officer uh, so I've had the joy of working with Amber for the last year and a half um, with Scott here as well. Uh, congratulations to him for his new role too. Hi everyone, uh, my name's Amber. Um, I'm calling from the unceded territory, nutritional territory of the Mi'kmaq people as well. I first want to say thank you so much for such kind words um, from everyone. It's been a journey for sure, but it's been because we're all doing this together. So I really appreciate you all and everyone taking the time to be with us today. Um, Scott, basically, um, I don't know what to call myself anymore now where we are in a transition. Um, so I was the I was the emergency management uh, program manager with the Better St. Mainland Mi'kmaq. I'm now transitioned out um, and it's being left in great hands. Um, and I'm now with Nova Scotia Health, um, public health as a health promoter. But I'm thankful I could take the time today to, to be here. Thanks, Amber. Um, so today we're here to talk about community guided approaches to emergency uh, preparedness. Uh, we're gonna start by just going through a little bit of background of uh, the Confederacy of Mainland Mi'kmaq. We'll shift into some of the projects we're currently working on in the emergency management department. And then we'll go into our uh, community gate community engagement methods piece. Um, so we'll just make sure everybody saw the the slides change. I'm hoping. Uh, okay, so just a little bit about CMM. So uh, CMM is a tribal council organization incorporated in in 1986. Uh, our organization, I believe, started with just a, a team of two staff members. And as Alana has said, things have gotten really big since then. We're now to a staff of over uh, 120 people. Um, CMM offers like a, a wide variety of services to the eight uh, mainland Mi'kmaq communities here in Nova Scotia. So um, aquatic resources and fisheries, uh, environment and natural resources, health services, um, 
community services and infrastructure, which uh, emergency management falls under, and a couple more, a couple more I'm missing. Um, so the governing body of CMM is made up of the chiefs of the eight uh, member communities, which you can see here on the map. And CMM's mission is to proactively promote and assist Mi'kmaq communities initiatives towards self-determination and enhancement of community. So we're just gonna jump around a little bit. I think there's probably gonna be a few of us talking here and there. Um, so just give everyone a little bit of awareness of that. Um, so just a quick overview of the emergency management program. Um, currently, um, we do focus on um, preparedness, uh, things such as planning and training. Um, a lot of focus is on awareness. And I think that's what a lot of um, this presentation and the sharing circles really gonna capture today in different ways we create the awareness and really focusing on community engagement. Um, we also, as a part of that comes education and then a lot of workshops. Um, we have shifted um, into more of a response um, focus as well and helping communities respond and really leading a, like a coordination um, effort and approach. Um, always looking towards different mitigation strategies within the work we do and within our communities. Um, and then, of course, we have to collaborate. So that's a big part of it, collaborating with our communities, collaborating with um, other organizations and folks such as yourself across Canada. And yeah, next slide. There might be some awkward transitions here. Um, so just to kind of step back a bit, like our program, um, it kind of started as just myself and uh, in a project. Um, and then over the years, we were really able as a group to really expand it and to turn it more into an emergency management program. Um, but the initial stages of that program really stemmed from looking at climate change and health adaptation strategies and how that related to emergency preparedness within our communities and kind of what that meant for our communities and then looking at some of the frameworks. Um, so when we first started the project, it was really to do like a needs assessment to see where our communities were at with emergency preparedness and, um, and prevention and really see in what ways do our communities want us to, to kind of shift this work um, and it really started to expand and build capacity. Um, and so, since there was such a big um, climate change component and health, like really making sure we're incorporating that into emergency management um, in various ways. Um, so here, this slide is just showing that we really took kind of two models and really tried to use those as our focus and framework um, and to blend those approaches together in order to do the work we're doing with um, all of our communities. Um, so here on the, my left hand side, um, we have the, the medicine wheel, which we focus on the mind, spirit, um, body and emotion side of it. Um, and then on the other side is we have the emergency management model, which focuses on prevention and mitigation, preparedness, um, response, and then recovery. Um, uh, this is a photo. So Almost a lot of our work is guided by our advisories, um, advisors and uh, community members. Um, so it's made up of various community members, council members, band staff, um, and they really help like shape and guide our projects. Um, so within that first year, um, when we're talking about community um, strategies. We really want to get the information from communities and really work with communities to develop this program. Um, so we really had to look at what are different ways we can do that. Um, so we did a large needs assessment in the beginning. Um, we had multiple um, discussions with the various health departments in each of our communities, um, tons of different types of workshops. And we also did um, large community surveys. Um, it was really to just try to get, um, get different people to participate and just find different avenues in which those folks can, um, and to really kind of build the framework for us taking a small project and really turning into an emergency management program. Um, so this slide, I think another key thing that really stemmed from um, working with Alana and working with our advisory um, committee is, is that in order for us to move forward within the work we're doing, we really have to reflect on the past. Um, so I think the key message was really remembering our past to prepare for our future and, and really taking away and looking at some of those assessments and workshops is what is it, what have our communities experienced in the past for emergency events, um, kind of what were some of the, 
the health outcomes as a result of those events and how do we relate that to climate change and and what are we taking away with that information to strengthen us and our preparedness um, going forward in the future um, and also by remembering that aspect of the past and Scott you can hit the next slide if you like um, it just gives us a larger picture and a fuller picture of um, emergency management in their communities and preparedness and also just really expanding um, what we can do. All right. So with that said, we'll shift into some of the projects that we're currently working on uh, within the emergency management program. Hand it over to Casey. So a big piece of what I do at CMM is emergency preparedness. And right now um, that's kind of taken a little bit less of a focus just because of COVID. We've had to shift to a much more responsive model of working. Um, but over the last uh, year and a half, we've done a lot of all hazards planning. Um, so what that looks like is developing a concept of operations for communities for responding to emergency events. Um, and with that, I really wanted to take a model that I can take um, the core pieces of what should go into this program and what they should be looking at, but present it to the community so that they can uh, develop that themselves uh, in a way that's really tailored to the community and specific for them. Uh, another big piece is Everbridge. So Everbridge is a mass notification system that we have implemented in all eight of our mainland communities. Um, this system is a way for communities to communicate prior to emergency events or during um, with community members at large, so it's giving them ways that they can prepare for a weather event coming, uh, letting them know if there are road closures or places to avoid during an event, uh, giving instructions for things like evacuation or a lockdown, um, and really adding a tool belt to, uh, for communities to work through crisis communications. Uh, another big piece of what we've been developing over the last year is a certificate of a professional studies in emergency management with the Nova Scotia Community College. So this program uh, we've developed directly with NSCC with input from our communities uh, to help prepare um, for each of our communities to have emergency management coordinators uh, and people that have To allow them to uh, build capacity that they don't currently have in communities. A lot of um, what's happening right now is we have committees uh, for emergency preparedness, but these are people that have other jobs in the community and it's something they're doing off the side of the desk, uh, not something they have uh, education in or um, overall experience in. It's people that are volunteering their time uh, to do emergency preparedness. Um, so this program would help. Uh, create a role for coordinators and communities. Uh, another big piece is ground search and rescue training. So this is something that we're starting in April. We are working with ground search and rescue Nova Scotia and with uh, Callion and SAR-1 to train uh, community members and uh, some of our emergency management contacts in communities in ground search and rescues. So that's going to include uh, the highest national standard for ground search and rescue, uh, as well as equipment and allow them to integrate pretty seamlessly into the provincial model for ground search and rescue. And then finally, I have Master of Disaster. So Master of Disaster, uh, if anyone is from BC is familiar, it's a educational program for youth that was developed through EMBC. Um, and that's something that we've been working to implement in communities just to get youth engaged uh, and to spread that education piece as well on emergency preparedness. All right. Um, so another thing that we're doing is search and rescue um, in the aquatic uh, realm. Um, so it ties into the search and rescue that um, Casey and, and Scott and Amber are, were planning and doing. Um, so the reason why I want to touch base on this is because um, our advisory um, was formed a few years ago and one of our advisory members, uh, Gerald Tony, um, 
he was one of the most um, key components and key persons and, and knowledge. The, the knowledge and information that man um, held was beyond any library, I think. Um, so he was a part of the advisory um, in my group and also with our, our group uh, for, um, uh, for, for their advisory. Um, so with that being said, Gerald has um, helped shape a lot of the work that we've done uh, within CMM as a whole. Um, and recently last year, Gerald has passed away. I'm sorry. Um, Gerald has been a huge mentor to me and to the work that we're doing. Um, he spent many years in search and rescue um, in ground and aquatic. Um, he worked up north. Um, he quite often would steal the show when um, in our advisories, telling stories about uh, his travels and his his work that he was his he was doing, uh, and and that kind of knowledge is you know it's priceless. And he brought a lot to you know both both advisory committees. Um, so with that being said, Gerald passed away um, last year in the midst of COVID, um, not due to COVID, but uh, you know for health reasons, um, Gerald had passed away. Um, and that's very unfortunate because, you know, he's going to be missed. Um, you know, his, his family is a huge part of our lives now um, after he's passed. Um, so we decided, so we acquired some funds to um, purchase some boats. Um, so one boat will be a research boat and the other boat is going to be our search and rescue boat. Um, we believe that the funding for this boat um, would work best um, as a search and rescue boat. So we have a research vessel, so we have two boats. And the search and rescue boat, um, we decided to bring that on because of, you know, this past year, I don't know if anyone knows, but um, at least three of our community and neighboring community boats have um, gone down. Um, and, and sunk and left our community members and others, um, you know, with minutes to spare. And we seen that as a huge need within our communities. Um, so this boat, uh, with the advice and guidance from our current advisory, uh, we named it after Gerald. Um, so our boat is, is Captain Gerald Tony. Um, so our search and rescue boat is named after Gerald. Um, so we're having a launching ceremony this spring with his family. Um, and they'll be there to, you know, bless this boat and, and get it going. Um, unfortunately, last year, uh, one of the boats that went down is from Gerald's community. There was people on the boat from the community. Um, so this boat will be housed uh, within a 15 minute drive from the community at a community owned wharf and it will be run by community members so you know being able to give the community members the tools and necessary training and and knowledge to you know be able to participate in search and rescue whether it's for ground or aquatic um you know it's 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 giving those communities you know that much more time to react and to get there when um when there's disasters or when there's accidents. Um, so, you know, giving those tools. So we're going to be how, um, hosting some training. Um, so we want people, we're encouraging people to join the uh, auxiliary um, and then become part of Marine Search and Rescue. Um, so we'll, uh, this is all paid for. Um, these will, um, if you can see on the poster, um, it's all volunteer um, and um, all of the, all of everything is paid for. So travel, food, accommodations, everything that we can provide for the community members to give them that equal opportunity to participate so that they can be there for their communities when there's disasters. Um, so there's the list of the trainings that uh, the community members will get. Um, 
And yeah, so, and they are also provided with um, all of the tools that they need um, on their boats once you get a part of the auxiliary to respond to um, disasters, whether, um, and being part of the auxiliary, you know, you can show up when there's place, uh, there's boats that need to be rescued, or, you know, if there's, you know, reports of people falling off, like we give the community members the tools to be able to respond. Um, and we, that's very important and um you know it's i'm very honored to talk about gerald today um you know because his legacy is going to live on within his community uh within this boat um and you know it's just another part and another piece in this big picture so thank you thanks alana Uh, so next, another big part of our uh, emergency um, management program is the wildfire um, resilience project. So what that kind of looks like is uh, going into communities and completing community wide wildfire assessments. So in that process, we're looking at um, vegetation type slope, um, proximity of homes uh, to surrounding forests. Um, road conditions in case of uh, evacuation and this type of thing and then really honing in on the uh, the home scale so um, we use fire smart home assessments and what that looks like is basically going door to door in community um, working with the homeowner and going through the assessment so we're looking at um, type of materials used uh, to build the roof the walls um, where are homeowners keeping their wood piles? Uh, what are their gutters looking like? So going through that list of things with them and just really providing pointers on how they can improve the, their home's resiliency to wildfire in case a wildfire should um, start or spread to their community. Um, another piece of that is community cleanup events. So you can see Amber here working the mower and Holly, a, a Bear River community member, um down in the bottom right corner um clearing vegetation away from bear rivers uh, cultural center they had vegetation um growing basically right up from the forest to the to the walls of the community center so we wanted to make sure that 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 was all cleared um another piece we do is, is street and and civic sign installation so basically what we're going for there is improving uh, emergency response. We want emergency responders to be able to know when they're go where they're going in case of an emergency. Um, so you can see these really nice signs up on the top of my slide here. Um, those were put in, in in Bear River last year and here Casey and I are uh, installing a civic sign in, in Buck and Gag First Nation. Um, we also organize wildland fire suppression training. So that's done through our, our provincial um, natural resources department where um, a team of folks comes into community um, and community members participate in uh, a classroom session. So where they're really learning about uh, fire behavior. And then there's also a practical um, portion to that too, where they're actually able to get out and work with the pumps and the hoses. Um, and volunteer firefighters, which is great. Uh, we also host uh, chainsaw safety and tree felling training for uh, interested community members. Um, they're able to sign up and really what the goal is here is to have uh, more community members trained so that, well, one, in, in case of an emergency, say a, a tree goes down over the road, that that capacity exists within community to clear those trees. Uh, and address that issue without having to call um, someone else to come in and do it for them. And also the wildfire mitigation piece. So um, having the capacity to clear trees around your own, your own home, your own yard is important. Uh, so fire break. So uh, we've had been working specifically with, well, with all of our communities, but um, a lot of our focus has been in uh, Bear River First Nation. That has been our our pilot community for this project. Um, and we're currently working with a contractor to have uh, a fire break um, put in around the entire perimeter of the community. So if you're uh, if you're unsure of, of what a fire break is, it's basically just um, a clearing of trees. So you go in, 
clear out uh, an area of trees. So it could be a 10 meter buffer, 15 meter buffer, 30 meter buffer, um, so that in case a fire starts outside of the community, um, that it just, it creates that gap to not really prevent the spread, but to allow for more time for evacuation or uh, response should it come to that from within the community. Um, and then dry hydrant installation. So we also uh, have had, um, we have some communities that don't have uh, readily available water. So in case uh, a fire were to happen within the community, uh, they would have to rely on, on fire departments that are sometimes um, not super close. Um, so of course the idea there is to have a, a readily available water source within the community in case of fire. And then also as uh, Casey's touched on and Amber's touched on um, in the past year, a lot of our focus has kind of shifted into a, a response mode. And of course, um, uh, COVID-19 has been a big part of that. So our team currently uh, supports all of our, our member communities with things like hotel isolation, um, isolating community members that um, need accommodations, um, vaccine clinics. So we go and help with registration of community members, uh, cleaning, cleaning areas, and then also testing clinics. You can see me sticking a stick up Casey's nose there. <laughs> <laughs> um, and Scott just here for COVID. In there. Great. Yeah, sure. Um, yeah. To another thing that like happened at the the mixed um, the beginning of COVID was um, seeing the collaboration not only from our communities but also from all our communities in um, Nova Scotia, where we all came together to form um, what we call a Migma Emergency Coordination Center in order to more effectively respond to the initial stages of COVID-19 and get those supports out that were needed to the community and do it more in a strategic and um, coordination type approach. Um, I think sometimes we kind of forget that that was kind of how we started because we are two years out there now, um, but that was a big part of it too and a big part of seeing all these different organizations come together in order to support our communities was quite powerful in that time. Amber. Uh, and training. So as a group, we do a lot of training with our community members, everything from uh, Jane's Health Safety um, and certification with that to emergency coordination centers, uh, incident command systems. Um, we recently did oil spill um, response training with the Canadian Coast Guard. Uh, in the middle, you can see uh, Leah, who unfortunately doesn't work with our team anymore, uh, asked uh, medical first responder training uh, in Dartmouth. It's a big piece of what we enjoy doing for communities is giving them opportunities that they might not have um, outside of this program and these funding streams um, to further their professional development, to get a little bit more experience with emergency preparedness and response. Um, and to really set them up to have that capacity and that knowledge in the community. So now we're going to kind of shift into our community engagement piece and the ways in which uh, we do engage with, with communities. Um, so how do we generate engagement? Really, in all of these projects, we like community to be involved from the very, very beginning uh, and make those programs and all the processes that go um, towards making those programs come to life as, as participatory as possible and getting that input from, um, be it chief and council. So maybe we'll set up a meeting with chief and council to get their input on, on what way they want this to go, what they feel the community's needs are, or in a, like a community workshop, for example, where we're doing the same thing with, with uh, the wider community. Um, but really all of, our, all of our projects, we strive for them to be totally community-led as much as possible. Really they're, they're there to guide our direction and we're there to support and kind of make sure things happen on our end. But really everything is, is centered around uh, community. Uh, 
uh, I can jump in a little bit here. Sure. Um, also, we we wanted to we recognize that you know not everyone gets the opportunity to travel outside the communities or they're not comfortable traveling outside the communities. So we try to do a lot of our training um, in the communities so that you know people who don't have access to vehicles or or anything like that or any barriers. You know we're we're having these. Um, some we're lucky to have some training be available and brought to communities. Um, you know, not everything can be brought in, but um, you know, just getting you know, getting those trainings or workshops within the community so that they're in reach and there's no barriers. And you know, we try to get the feelings out um, prior to um, inviting people, like making sure um, you know we have access if there's any mobility issues or literacy issues, and uh, you know even language barriers um, come up once in a while. You know, making sure that people don't need translators um, because a lot of our elders, you know, still speak the language, so they might want translators or they don't understand some of the terms that we're using. Um, you know, and it gives that equal opportunity. And like Scott said, like having you know, our advisories and our BODs and our chiefs and councils um, being there from the planning stages um, that allows us to, you know, look at that through a different lens um, and, and provide what works best for the communities at hand. And we don't have this one blanket thing that works for every community because every, every community is different. Every community is isolated different. Other communities are, are their locations are different. Um, so we want to make sure that we, you know, are giving that equal opportunity to all um, our community members, whether you're five years old or 105 years old, um, you know, making sure that we are trying our best to, to identify those barriers and, and working with them. You know, community engagement is challenging. I've been, um, with the community engagement since my time uh, seven and a half years ago. Um, but, you know, I have expertise because I'm a community member. So I know what works for communities and, you know, just changing the way things look and, and sound, um, you know, in, in, in incorporating that cultural aspect. Um, you know, all of the little infographics that we used in the workshops in the beginning, um, you know, we were like, oh, we'll use chart paper. And I was like, Amber, let's make them pretty. And, you know, we incorporated the medicine wheel and we incorporated infographics um, just to make it a little bit more, you know, personal and friendly. And, you know, and people like were really um, like into these posters because they were well laid out and there was like images on there and people could, you know, kind of relate to what's going on. Um, so, you know, just making sure that we're looking at all aspects of the community engagement. Um, go ahead, Scott. Sure. Uh, yeah, just to kind of jump off that piece too, coming to this work as a, as a non-community member, it was really important, and it's really important for everyone at CMN that is not a community member, um, to get to know communities. We have eight member communities, and like Elena said, every community is different. It really, it comes down to especially in those beginning stages, spending the time, showing up, like getting to know people, and then um, proceeding with the work in ways that, that best suit the needs of, of those individuals and those individual um, communities. Like we do not have a blanket approach for anything that we do really for, for all of our eight communities. Amber, or Casey, I don't know if you want to jump in there. One thing I will just jump into talking about participation. I think something that um, we've seen over time too, like um, our organization and I think all the work that we're all doing, we really try to participate as much as possible ourselves, right? And we try to be there and be there with community and create that consistency that we're, if, if we're asking someone to participate in something, we're going to be there beside them doing it. And mm -hmm. I think that like really reflecting on that looks like it, it builds a bit of that like relationship and that partnership that we're all doing it kind of together. And um, we didn't hire someone to put in the signs, like our community members went and did that themselves and we helped where we could. Um, and just kind of creating some of that capacity itself. Um, just to add there. Yeah, a big piece of having those relationships is also generating trust. Like we're not just 
random people coming in and saying, okay, this is what we're going to do. We are people that they know, they're, we're faces they recognize, and you build those personal relationships. And that's how you generate effective programs, how you generate effective engagement and really get to know people and, and identify those things that you can do for them. And really in general, it's just, it's a much nicer way to work. <laughs> like when you get to know everyone on a personal level, like I love, love, love going into community and working with um, folks from all of our communities, which makes COVID especially hard for us at CMM, uh, having to work from home and not go into communities. We're kind of um, having to contact virtually and on the phone, which can be tricky, but nevertheless, still trying to keep uh, our communication uh, consistent and collaboration as consistent as we can, regardless of how that looks. And these are just some more uh, pictures of some different types of engagement sessions and things that we've done. Um, so you'll see in the top right corner, this was a, a Fire Smart landscaping event. So just a little bit of background, I guess, about what Fire Smart landscaping is. Um, Fire Smart Canada has a guide um, that lists all of the plants that um, should be planted near your home that have a, like a high water content that don't permit promote the, the spread of wildfire. Um, and one of the plants on that list is uh, tulips. So we have a couple of times now um, gone down to, this photo was taken in Bear River at their cultural center um, and dug flower beds and, and planted uh, tulips around the cultural center. Um, you'll see on the, on the bottom left corner, um, some kids getting into a helicopter. That was another uh, wildfire awareness event where um, I believe the Provincial Department of Natural Resources brought in their, their helicopter, which was really cool <laughs> for everyone. Everyone got to, to check that out. And we also do, you know, um, bring fire trucks in and have the kids can go in the fire trucks. And that's always fun for everyone. Um, and you'll see us with our chainsaws down here. Um, like Amber said, we often are uh, side by side with community members taking training and things like that. So um, we have also all become um, chainsaw certified. So now we're available for communities if, if there is an emergency or in the case uh, of these pictures here, if trees have uh, fallen down over their, their community trails that we can go help out. Um, Amber, I believe you might be able to speak better to the picture on the top right than I can. Yeah, so the top photo was, um, I think that was within one of the first years um, when we're really trying to just talk about emergency preparedness um, with our communities and try to reach different audiences. So we went into one of our schools in Truro um, and, and met with the youth there to have those discussions with them. So I think it's really about um, finding different ways and different strategies to kind of meet people where they are. Um, and find opportunities for those as well. Okay. Uh, and here we have a different take on uh, emergency management. So I'll hand this one over to Casey and Alana. So Emergency management itself as a field is traditionally very uh, rigid, it's very militaristic, um, and it has a heavy background with um, military policing and those structures, and that doesn't always fit very um, easily across uh, two communities. It's not something that is second nature, and it's a little bit more fluid and a little bit more holistic. So. What we try to do is look at a bigger picture and look outside of those traditional lenses to see how we can improve emergency preparedness in non-traditional ways, or I guess more traditional ways um, with things like, uh, and Amber can, and Elena can speak to these um, events that are pictured here as well, um, but doing things like fish smoking, uh, canning, traditional food preparation, uh, things that don't require some of those modern um, amenities that can give 
youth uh, a little bit more confidence in their ability to um, do things without those and to do things on their own and to be prepared in ways that you might not think of if you're not looking for, through that lens. Um, and really working on developing that community level response first and that capacity development. So knowing that um, they don't have to go outside of themselves, they can be self-sufficient for emergency response and have that capacity to um, manage at a community level. I'll go ahead and Amber, and then I'll talk a little bit about some of our uh, workshops and, and events that we had. So if you can see the uh, poster, um, that's what we did. We took the approach of, you know, kind of looking into the past um, and, you know, being able to help guide the work that we're doing um, in the future. Um, so, you know, that's what we did with those workshops and taking that up approach of, you know, traditional knowledge and, um, um just the traditional lens you know the Mi'kmaq lens um and how we could do that so putting those with workshops and also we did a um there's a school in my community um and they're trying to switch to more land-based learning um and outdoor education um so uh, myself and amber and a few other people from our department uh we came together and we created this um this education day so we went um we talked about you know um all of the science stuff that we're doing with species and water and 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 you know amber talked about all of her emergency preparedness stuff and you know we talked all about all of this um you know western science and knowledge and, and ways of knowing uh but we also twisted it and and used you know that in the two-eyed seeing approach um i'm not sure if a, a lot of people are uh familiar with two-eyed seeing but i'll give you a little uh snippet of what two-eyed seeing is so this is a concept that was um, made by Elder Albert Marshall and his late wife, Merdina Marshall, with the assistance of Cape Breton University. Um, so this concept is to look at the world with two sets, with you, both of your eyes, but one eye is going to be, you know, traditional Indigenous knowledge. Um, and the other one is, you know, looking at the world in a worldview of Western uh, knowledge and science. Um, so, you know, when you combine those two knowledge systems, um, you know, it creates a stronger uh, foundation for the work that you're doing. Um, you know, this this approach has been um, the, you know, paving the path for a lot of the work to be done. Um, reconciliation, um, you know, just and, and helping, um, you know, helping the educators and the scientists and academic world um, to understand where we're coming from as First Nations people. Um, it, it, it allows them to see the, the world in, in the way that we see it and the way we uh, view it. Um, so this concept is, you know, it's gaining um, national um, recognition. And I think globally it's starting to, um, um, to take off, you know, it's because this concept, even though it was made by Mi'kmaq people, you know, indigenous knowledge is, is everywhere, you know, it's in every parts of the world. So it can be used in many different um, tribes and communities and cultures. Um, so taking that um, to the schools and doing that. So what happened, if you look at the three pictures on the right, um, Amber's there preparing um, some bass. So what had happened is uh, my colleague had talked about, you know, the science part of the bass, um, you know, the biology, the parts, you know, what the fins were for, all that stuff. And then I talked about, you know, the cultural aspect of the fish. And then we shared um, some of the stories and legends around this fish. And, you know, then we got to fillet the fish in front of the kids. We asked the fish, the kids, if they wanted to fillet the fish. So these kids are up here, you know, learning the science and learning the knowledge, the traditional knowledge and these stories and legends, but they're also getting that hands-on experience. And they're like, well, what are we going to do with this fish? And um, we're like, we're going to cook it and we're going to eat it. And they're like, where are we going to cook it? You know, there's no kitchen outside and uh, we bring our fireplace. <laughs> Um, and, you know, we all worked together and uh, it was amazing, you know, seeing these kids learn and being, um, 
you know, so we taught them the tools um, to, to get these fish, to identify the parts on it and learn how to cook it. And, you know, we talked about like Amber made this awesome sauce that made, uh, made this fish taste good. And like the kids just kept coming back and eating it. And some of them didn't even have bass. And, you know, bass is a historically a uh, significant fish to us, our people. It lives in our, our cultural river, um, the river right next to our community, um, you know. So, and then the next day after this outdoor education, we actually went fishing for bass. Um, so all these kids, some of it, was, sometimes it was their first time ever going fishing. It was their first time catching the bass. It was the first time hearing these stories and, 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 and the knowledge. So, you know, combining all of this, these worldviews, um, you know, helps give those opportunities to those children um, and to the youth. Um, you know, it was it was really nice to see that these kids now have the tools and the knowledge to go catch a fish. Um, you know, they know where these fish are now. They know how to catch them. They know how to descale them and fillet them. And now they know how to cook them over um, a fire, which is, you know, something that you don't learn in school, you know, you learn to cook over a stove or whatever it may be. But, you know, like even Amber got assistance with them, you know, teaching them how to start a fire, you know, all those little parts that you need to start that fire, because you can't just chuck some logs on and light it up, you know, there's, there's parts to making a fire. So being able to um, share that knowledge as well, you know, it prepares these youth for, you know, if they had to feed an elder, they can go do that. Um, you know, if they had to start a fire, they can go do that. Um, and these are the types of things, and this is the type of approach that more of our um, communities need, more really the world needs, um, you know, just so that we can have that sovereignty and knowing that, you know, we will not starve, we will not be stuck, we are resilient, um, you know, and even if it's, you know, combining modern stuff with traditional stuff, um, you know, we gave those tools and at the end of the day, I can be happy and I know that, you know, that day that we made a huge difference in these, in these youth, so. Yeah, and I really think also what Alana's touching on is it's this holistic piece of bringing all these aspects together and telling that story through the process if we're talking about the bass. Um, but it also helps like create these memories and also helps create linking all these things together and why we're doing something. Instead of just taking one of those aspects, say we just took the fish and just smoked it. Um, I think it goes a lot further when you bring in everything else into that. Um, and also just a lot of learning, like, to be honest, I wasn't, I'm not much of a fish person myself, and I wasn't familiar with the smoking process, but I made sure I was going to learn and try to share what I learned with others in that way. And I think that's okay, too, to acknowledge, like, when we're still learning something, um, but yet we're still trying to share it with others, um, which is kind of what everything is about in that collective. Yes. Um, and under the, the capacity development piece, I guess really everything we've been talking about today falls under, under that capacity development. Um, working as closely as we can with communities, making um, everything we do as participatory as possible from beginning to end. Because as Casey mentioned, really what we would like to see are uh, emergency management coordinators in all of our member communities um, so that that capacity exists within community. Um, and really, this is this is how we do that. We need to um, share what we know with community. They share with us what they know. Um, yeah. And then I guess our last piece here is is challenges and barriers. So I'll uh, I'll kick this one off. I guess. Um, so as I've already mentioned, and I'm sure everyone is already expecting me to say, COVID has been a really big barrier in the last, last couple of years. As I said, uh, we haven't really been able to get into community as much as we would like um, during periods of uh, where we've had to be uh, working from home, which does make things difficult, but um, we do try to keep that communication as, as consistent as possible with, with our community members um, to ensure that uh, we keep the momentum up on our projects, but that we, the connection 
uh, doesn't fade. Yeah, and Scott, I'll just, I also think too, like um, COVID did create some challenges, but also COVID showed us a lot of strengths too that our communities have within working together um, and coming together to overcome some challenges, but also it, it has opened up different avenues for how we create community engagement um, that we talk a lot of times about virtual and like people getting tired of the virtual over and all, like over time, but virtual is also creating another um, accessibility for folks to join as well who maybe aren't able to come in person. So we are seeing a lot of those positives as well um, that we're taking away from this. And, um, and I think just from the work that we're all doing, we're also fortunate enough um, going through COVID, but communities were still, we we're still able to get into communities and do some of the work. Um, and I think that says a lot too as well. It's still, even though it's COVID, still trying to find those ways where we can work with communities safely, um, given some of the precautions and um, restrictions that were at place. Yeah. Anything else on challenges from Alana, Casey? Um, I think challenges and barriers is, you know, um, sometimes it's lack of funding and opportunity, um, but, you know, we seem to overcome those. Um, I probably had a lot more, but, you know, I'm just seeing all the brighter side of everything. Um, <laughs> um, yeah, COVID has been one of the hugest barriers, I think, but, uh, you know, just I think that we've worked really well trying to get over any challenges and barriers that have uh, have come our way. I think that we've, you know, showed our resiliency and our strength through, uh, you know, our, our lives and our work lives, too. So, yeah, I, I don't have anything to add, but Casey? Yeah, honestly, for us, one of the biggest challenges is getting people's time. And a lot of that comes down to um, the fact that a lot of people we work with are doing this on a volunteer basis. Um, we've mentioned it a few times, but having someone in community that's dedicated to emergency management and has that role um, that they can really take on and um, do some of those activities at a community-based level would make the world of a difference because people are getting burnt out. They've been, um, struggling with COVID and, and having the time to do their own job on top of emergency management stuff. And then you add in COVID and then um, we're going through winter right now. So winter flooding, snowstorms, all those other pieces, it just really takes a lot out of community members. Um, so I think that's probably one of the biggest challenges we have in doing the work is, is having that capacity and that time for people. And I think, oh, slide. go ahead there. No, no, I was just going to say, I'm not sure if there's another slide after this. Um, okay, just more pictures. Just some more pictures, yeah. This stuff we do. Perfect. And I guess here's a good spot to open it up for questions. I'll, uh, I'll stop sharing my screen. Wow, I am just, I feel so inspired. It's incredible. The work that's been accomplished uh, in, in relatively short period of time and the incredible heavy lifting that Amber has done with Alana over this period to build literally a best practices program. Alana's job was one of the first that really combined climate and emergency in one word. And I think that title really lived its full potential. And Alana, obviously the very heavy lifting that you've done from the start of engaging community, I feel incredibly inspired. I think this is a must watch for um, both indigenous and non-indigenous communities in what, what can be done and what kind of capacity can be built. So if we can just all join in a gallery view, we'll just have a little bit of sharing and question period now. So if you can just um, under the view, uh, so we can see each other's faces. And if you're open, it would be wonderful if we can turn the videos on. This is the best we've got. And as um, uh, was mentioned, actually, a lot of accessibility and participation was added through kind of Zoom, uh, Zoom sorry, um, joining. So 
If you feel comfortable turning your video on, please do. And uh, um, Scott, you can probably share the, the question period, just take questions from people. So I see Tracy has her hand up. It would be great to hear from you, Tracy. Thank you. I can't turn my uh, video on because uh, my internet uh, connectivity goes way down. So I apologize for that. I just wanted to um, say thank you for sharing. That was very interesting. And I really was keen on the focus when you talked about um, the youth engagement with the fish smoking and, and tr giving them the skills um, to like build fires and feed an elder if they had to. And I know in, I'm from Ontario, by the way, and I know during the early days of the pandemic um, that in, in the more Northern regions where they were more locked down, the, the smaller First Nations, uh, food security was a really big um, focus on how to provide uh, food for um, the community members when you wanted them to stay in the community and they couldn't get out to the, you know, the towns and cities. And, and I, I see that food uh, security is becoming more and more prevalent as an issue. And I, and I really like the way you kind of highlighted that, <clears throat> touching on that with the fish smoking and it's really a great opportunity to frame it with an emergency management terms, but really going back to the traditional ways of how do you take care of uh, not only yourself, but your community, but not just with food, but how to prepare it, how to store it, like that knowledge is there and bringing it forward within this framework of, of food security. So I just wanted to comment and say, I thought that was fantastic. Thank you. Tracy, um, and, and I just wanted to talk a little bit about that. And, um, so I have, uh, I, I acquired funding to, um, to start a project. Um, and this project had came from, I seen my friend posting online saying, oh, I just tried deer for the first time and um, it was gross and or it was moose sorry and I was like it was gross and I'm like no it's so good and you know it got me thinking I'm like wow our, our taste buds have been so colonized that our, our traditional foods people are turning their nose on or saying that they're gross um, and you know so that got me thinking so I, I made a project so that we are I wanted to call it decolonizing our taste buds but um, <laughs> I wasn't able to so it's called Mi'kmaq knowledge and food. Um, so what will happen is we are going to go to each community. They're going to pick two species that they want to learn about. And what will happen is we will take, um, we will gather information and knowledge from knowledge holders, elders, youth, uh, everyone and anyone who wants to participate about the two targeted species. Um, and then we're going to find out how these foods were were prepared, how they were caught, um, you know, how people smoke them or, or, you know, dried them and, you know, get people to um, taste them and, and enjoy them and, and then share that knowledge. Uh, so we'll do videos um, and be able to have those available for, for anyone to, to use so that they know that, you know, all of these foods are here. Um, we're going to use parts of the Mi'kmaq calendar uh, because the Mi'kmaq calendar and ecological knowledge lets us know, you know, each month there's a, there's a food, there's something that Mother Earth is giving us um, to, to survive. Um, you know, and we're using the, the, the ecological knowledge to, to identify those foods. So, you know, that's where, you know, a little bit of that came from, uh, was from what we did with Amber and the school and, you know, what my friend was saying about moose. And I'm like, you know, we really need to give our communities the knowledge and information and the tools to be able to to provide for themselves um, because, you know, this, if this pandemic has taught anybody, you know, food sovereignty and, and, you know, what are we going to do? You know, I seen everybody panicking because the shelves of the grocery store were empty and I'm in my backyard eating green beans from a, from a, 
you know, a, a garden that I that I made. So, you know, being able to help our community members, you know, provide so that they're not stressing out, um, you know, provide for themselves um, is, is, is my goal for my job, uh, for one of the projects that I'm doing. And, you know, some of that stemmed from what we did with um, the communities. So, yeah. Thank you, Tracy. there are any questions, observations, comments, uh, we would love to hear them from you. Go ahead, Kyla, please. Oh. Thank you so much for this presentation. It's always so interesting coming to these and learning about the projects you do. Um, I work for ISK Emergency Management and so we often see these projects go by and we approve them, but when you work at least in headquarters, you don't get the backstory and the photos that accompany them. And it's such a it's such a disconnect from the work that's being done on the ground. So this just highlights such a greater need for funding. And it's so inspiring to see how we can support more in the future. And just I think about the search and rescue training with the boat and the backstory, and we just we don't get much of that. So as a public servant, this is really appreciated to be able to just, you all come together and you take the time to really go through every slide with us. It's very appreciated. So thank you so much. And just kind of kudos to you too for leading, uh, you know, coming in in the space of a student and leading this work. It's just that as Alana said, she's, uh, Amber started as a summer student, right? So you youth in these positions, indigenous youth in these uh, positions in the government and other organizations play such a huge role. So really grateful for the work that you do and the community that's around you that supports you, how Alana stepped in and became, as she was saying, their friends and colleagues and supporting each other. So I think it's up to all of us to create these environments that support the youth in growing and reaching their potential. So really grateful for the work that you do, Kyla, as well. And maybe I don't know if there is more questions, but maybe we could also open up this space. Like, I would love to hear from other folks on like kind of your take on community engagement, and maybe some of the things you're doing within your work um, and kind of what that looks like, because I know we have different people here in this uh, group. Please go ahead, Gina. Uh, yeah, sorry, that's a really good question. Um, uh, what, what do we do for community engagement and around emergency preparedness here in the Yukon is part of the work that I do with um, uh, the, the, uh, is, is develop and design and community safety officer programs. And they're sort of like the peacekeepers, um, the conduit, the liaison, eyes and ears of the community. And we've got to, um, out of 14 communities here in the north, 11 are self-governing. And we currently have... Um, four successful programs up and running and we're on to next couple of communities. And what we do is we call um, almost like a three circled approach. And we go in and we work with the, with the government and develop and design their occupational health and safety within the government first. When I say government, I refer to our self-governing first nation. And then we do what I call a community assessment. I do an analysis of the community, look at their policies, procedures, what kind of emergency preparedness plan do they have? Is it up to date? Um, you know, even their occupational health and safety, um, uh, housing policies, et cetera. And I do what they call a meta-analysis of everything, and I come up with recommendations. Also, a community engagement. I ask the communities, what are their priorities within these three levels? Um, and um, what I do, and what do we do at the end of it is we come back, and sometimes we do um, sometimes face-to-face -face, um, meetings. We can go into... Um, community surveys, online surveys, to get the community feedback of what do they think and feel would support them in terms of safety. And I talk about human safety, but I also talk about safeties where um, we don't have control of uh, the environment of forest fires, flooding, et cetera, and how do we prepare them? 
So we come up with these recommendations. Um, so do I do the occupational health and safety internally? Then we go in and we do a community assessment and the work crime prevention through environmental design that we also do in the community is looking at the physical infrastructures of keep making the community safe. Do they have proper housing on numbers? You know, do they have proper street signs as some of you talked about? Um, do we have a muster point set up? Do we have do we have a cargo van that's set up um, for our elders to transport them out and get them to the muster point? Now, are we able to set up in a, in a safe location? Uh, so we look at that um, the, for the community assessment. Then the then there's the whole emergency preparedness. Is the third circle we wrap around our communities? Is we look at how do we engage the community to <clears throat> to prepare for natural disasters? And I don't even think. They're all natural disasters because some can be um, man-made sort of human disasters. So we, we look at those three levels. And one of the areas that we really want to strengthen in um, with you is with the with the preparing our homes would be incredible to learn about more about that third wraparound services that we do provide in the communities. We are doing it, but I think you have a lot more experience in what you're doing out there to help us move that third component forward. As we all are across Canada and the world, we're dealing with the natural disasters. We've been hit with um, floods in our communities um, and um, and and um, fire, forest fires, and these impact us because you talk about um, you know food sovereignty, right? And when the when the roads are closed, how, where do we get our food? In particular, in the north, where there's one road is closed, it's your main transportation route to the north. So how do we go back to creating our own food, you know, how do we go back to living off the land, et cetera. So we do do that in the north here. Um, we have been engaging with Lily. It's been fantastic because um, um, this is where we're going. That's the direction is becoming more and more of our priority going forward. So um, if you're willing and wanting to learn more about that, we can certainly work through Lily to, to organize something. Maybe I, I think Lily, we talked about doing a presentation in April. Yeah, Dina will be sharing a circle in April and there'll be some also exciting partnership announcements and things like that. So I really hope that uh, Migma, some of you will be able to attend as well as other people in the circle. But um, we're also hoping to have our gathering in the fall. So Gina, to meet Alana and Amber in person, I think would be invaluable to really sit down and, and kind of like, what were the challenges? Because I know there were numerous challenges in getting the program off the ground. But the team is just so strong and committed and the capacity grew so fast, which in itself is a problem sometimes just managing that piece internally, right? So I think that would be really invaluable learning that direct nation to nation learning that will be happening. So absolutely. Yes, Gina's okay. circle is in April and I highly recommend you attend incredible, incredible changes, right? Gina, if you could just share once the community officers program went in, what kind of changes happened, right? So. Uh, the, the, the level of safety that women would feel on the streets compared to the, before the program came in. So the powerful story is here, really nations reclaiming their safety, right? Like, so the, the, all this work, the capacity building piece, the Mi'kmaq story is an incredible, exceptionally beautiful story. So I think uh, if, if, if we all use this avenue to share the story, to inspire the work that's happening in our communities, it's certainly a lot of lessons to be learned, absolutely. Thank you. I look forward to your session, Gina. And thank you for sharing. Sorry, Elena. Thank you. I'll put my website on the um, chat here. Okay. Gina, you know, I had a question just when you were talking about um, coming up with recommendations. I think sometimes, like, some of our challenges and I think we maybe did not didn't mention it as much as like um once recommendations are provided how do we help ensure and um, encourage those to be followed up with at the community level because I think sometimes that's a bit of a barrier where it might stop especially when we're dealing with capacity challenges really good question and I, I get that a lot in particular in our indigenous communities where the community size is 400 in particular and we always, um, you know, um, I think one of the biggest challenges people say, well, where are we going to get the people? And I said, well, maybe we have to be a little bit creative and design those positions. 
and have people lead. People need to be paid. You know, we can volunteer so much, but people need employment. And the, the success of this community safety officer program led to funding dollars coming in. And um, because it's so holistic, it's, it's safety, it's wellness, it's everything. It's a wraparound services, MMIWG. You can tap into a number of um, a number of uh, funding sources. And what we found is in the Yukon, the First Nations are investing up front. So they own the program. Nobody can dictate to them who, who can do what. You have to send in your 16 page reporting before I advance you the funds, et cetera. So the, the, the secret to the success is trying to get your First Nation government, your, your, your bands um, to invest up front. And because the because it's the ownership and the accountability and the pride comes back to that community and you slowly step it out and roll it out. But nothing is, says that you can't find you can get your First Nation to partner, you know, with somebody else or maybe the government. But you they have to own it. So the idea is to um, hire a safety officer, maybe in your case, emerge prepared person to take the lead and. I found it very successful because in a community of 400, I have three full-time community safety officers and three part-time. And these are citizens from the community. They don't need their master's degrees or a PhD degree or a, a education that's you know in, in post-secondary because it's really hard to find that. I want the, the person that's been living in that community, that's their master's degree right there, right? Because I don't have that. And that's the knowledge and traditions and culture. And that's what we immerse this program in. And for them to do that, I'll tell you, they, they dropped the police calls in one community in one year from 1,076 police calls to 666 the next year, a 40% drop in police services, which reduces the overall um, social um, safety crisis in every department, with child and welfare, policing, probations, courts, whatever you want. I think I've given away my presentation, but anyhow, um, what I'm saying is the success is finding your own in the community, put it out there, mentor them. We find um, uh, if there's individuals that, you know, really have the passion in their heart, we mentor them. I mentor them. And, and my colleague here, um, Vikram, he, he's in the background. He's my operations manager. And we go out and we mentor them. And we find people to mentor them. And so there's so many ways to um, tackle this and be creative, innovative, reach out. I also will post my phone number and and um, you know uh, we'll share whatever we can uh, for you to um, be successful in your own community. Thank you so much, Gina. Amazing. So if this is exactly what this space is for, for this type of sharing, if there are any other comments, please uh, let us know or questions because we still have a smudging at the end to close the circle. Elena will um, close the circle in a beautiful Mi'kmaq way. So please uh, come forward if you have any questions or comments. Maybe some final thoughts from our the, the hosts of the circle today. If uh, Casey Amber Scott, if you would like to say a few words before we part, that would be beautiful as well. Nothing really more from me than just a thank you. Really appreciate everyone coming together for this and, and sharing their thoughts. It's you know invaluable to hear what's going on in, in other parts of the country and you know see in what ways we can kind of incorporate that into what we do to make. Um, our community is more successful in, in emergency preparedness and management. So thanks. I want to say thank you as well. And Gina, I'm really looking forward to your presentation in April. I'll, I'll just kind of echo the thanks across for everyone. Um, also want to just put another um, but there that like when we really like combine like health aspects into a lot of the work we do, we really get this more holistic approach. And I think that's a lot of stuff that we shared with everyone here. I think that piece is always there. And I think that makes it really important for the work we do. Um, and also to bring that into our communities. And 
and to look at that aspect even when we're doing community engagement right and how are we creating a safe space a welcoming space um and overall how is that benefiting our communities at a healthy level not just um for emergency preparedness are we getting the information that we would like or are we um sharing that back and forth um i also just want to take this quick time too to thank um lily and preparing your homes um just seeing this network and and everyone coming together over the last few years has been super beneficial and super powerful and just having another space where we connect with folks um across the country has been really great for the work that we do um and even just building those connections so i just i really appreciate that i've seen things like in the last five years really come a long way um and it's really exciting and I, and I hope to share this where I'm going. I hope to share this with them so that they can even just step into this because um, we could be doing a lot more of this in other avenues and other areas of work as well. So thanks. Well, thank you, Amber and Scott and Casey. Um, it was great working with you guys and, and you know, uh, preparing this presentation and getting ready for, you know, sharing the information and, and everything that we've done over the past few years. So thank you. And I think that this department's in good hands with Scott and Casey. Um, I feel a little sad because I have to walk away again and Amber's walking away, but uh, I'm always here for, for guidance and, and anything that you need. Uh, I got to go back to my river now. <laughs> Um, and, and a huge thank you to you, Lily, um, for, you know, creating this space, uh, you know, for from the past circles and to this present and to the future circles, um, you know, this type of, of platform is needed, um, you know, so that we can share our knowledge and, and, you know, the tips and tricks and everything that we, you know, you know, we can take into account sharing these knowledges, um, you know, because some things that work in other communities, you know, we might not have thought of and we're able to bring that knowledge and bring that back to our communities. And if we're able to give information and knowledge that other people can use in their communities and their realms, um, you know, you, you've done your job um, with this this uh, platform. So thank you, Lily. Um, it's It's been an honor to be a part of, of this. Um, and it's an honor to have known you these past few years as well um so thank you um so i just want to close today with another smudge uh, my smudge has been on and off through this entire um presentation uh, which gives me gives me um happy thoughts and happy feelings um so i just wanted to um ask the creator to continue to give everyone the strength and the knowledge and the tools to continue doing this great work um, within their communities and, and their um, offices or wherever you may be. Uh, we ask the creator to, you know, continue to protect you through this pandemic and, you know, your communities and, you know, give you the um, give you good things and good thoughts and, um, you know, the creator like you said, Lily, it, it always stuck with me and it's, I hear it a lot in all of our teachings, you know, you're, you're exactly where you're meant to be um, when you're meant to be there. And, you know, this is a true story and a true uh, example of that, um, you know, getting to know you and your family and, and, you know, getting to know the people on the call, uh, even though we didn't talk a lot, but, you know, knowing that there's like-minded people out there, um, gives me hope for the future and hope for my children. Um, so uh, I just ask the creator to continue to give everyone um, love and hope and hard work and dedication. So we'll all in and we'll all yoke.